So I could not be more delighted today to have with us G. Winfrey. Unfortunately, his video is not working, but we've got his voice loud and clear. Welcome, G. Thank you for having me here. I'm honored and humbled and it's a pleasure. I feel the same way. It is so good to see you <laughs> in freedom and to have you yeah. on this call. Could you please Thank tell you. us a little bit about how you got started in the theater and your work with Shakespeare Behind Bars? Okay. Um, well, I was in prison wasting my life away. Uh, I met some friends of mine. I always had a knack to learn something different, do a little bit of positivity in my life. And uh, so I was well-versed in reading and things of that nature. But I had some friends that were real gangsters, still are, um, changed their life over and one of them invited me to Shakespeare Behind Bars, and I was like, Shakespeare, come on, man, I know that guy, right? I read some of his works. Uh, why would you invite me? But I knew this guy, and I knew this guy was a stand-up guy, right? This guy, uh, well-known throughout uh, Michigan, is one of the uh, top notches, and uh, he was in it, and still is in it, and it changed his life. So he invited me, and uh, I went, and epiphany after epiphany, and experience after experience and the immortal words of Shakespeare, the circles, um, the guests, Ashley, you were one of them, uh, changed my life drastically, made me have a deeper level of empathy and different vision, perspectives and concepts and gave me mission and purpose. And uh, I was a lifer two times over and uh, but 30 years in, here I sit and I know it's behind that. Without a doubt of contradiction, everything else failed me. But the arts found me and ushered me right on in. And here I stand right now today, free man, um, businessman, got my own law service. I work, taxpaying law-abiding citizen. Um, here I stand, contributing member of society. That is beautiful, G. Did you have any Thank relationship you. to the theater before somebody told you you needed to get involved with the Shakespeare group? No, ma'am, none whatsoever. And Never. what did you think the theater was, if you thought about it at all? I didn't. I had. I think everybody know about Romeo and Juliet. Um, I didn't ever think of theater as being a life changing experience. I didn't never see it as going beneath the surface. I never seen it as anything beyond what it was. Um, I seen it as just a part of entertainment. I didn't see the education part of it. I didn't see the spirituality in it. I didn't see the connection of it. And <laughs> my God, I mean, like I say, it uh. It amazes me to this day. Um, a lot of stuff that people try to explain to me, I could never completely wrap my mind around, like responsibility, accountability. Um, I go back to Caesar. Um, man, at some point, a master of his own fate. The fault is not in the stars, but in ourselves. Uh, stuff like that hits me to my gut. That's the first really big epiphany that hit me out of Shakespeare Behind Bars under the tutelage of Curry O'Toffin. Uh, that hit me like, this is what they're talking about, responsibility and accountability. It's not outside of you. It's inside of you. Uh, stuff like that made me grow up. Um, Hamlet, act one, scene one. Uh, who's there? And they answer me, stand and unfold yourself. Stuff like that. Like, why would I unfold myself when I couldn't just tell a person who I was? And it was telling me that was a constant, rigorous, uh, consistent thing, saying that you would stay from the ages. And these were words from Shakespeare from eons ago. So things of that nature kept me up at night, making me think, pace the cell. Um, what's this guy talking about? I mean, it was many of us that walked in prison yards. Like, what is this guy talking about? And I mean, these are some stand up guys. These ain't guys that, uh, no disrespect that was in there for carjacking or stealing a purse or snatching a ham or something. These are guys that were really them guys. And them questions there really led me off into myself to see something with myself. Like, really, who am I? We have four questions we ask. Who am I? What do I love? What is my gift to humankind? How will I live my life knowing that I would die? Nobody never in life asked me that. Not the church, not the state, not the police, not no politician. Not nobody never asked me that except for Kurt and him. And that stuff really made me think about life. Like, if I fell dead right now, what would they really say about me? What would be my contribution to society if everything went bad right now? How would I live my life regardless of where I'm at? If I'm in prison, am I being a positive asset and a fashionable that's suitable for somebody to say something good about me and not no lying preacher that to say something where he gave his life to the Lord at the age of three, when I don't even know what life was really was at the age of three. 
So the arts really ushered me right on in, like, we accept you who you are, but I want you to know who you are. They didn't give me that part. The arts did. Through many, many, many rigorous conversations that we had within the circle, doing plays and things of that nature, it took me elsewhere where I never, ever would have went anywhere without the arts. I know it, without a doubt of contradiction. That is beautiful, G. I'm so grateful to have heard your words today. We're going to come back and talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to come back and talk to you a little bit more later, but now we're going to shift over to Katie Langford, who joins us all the way from London, England, and she's going to talk to us about a theater company in Melbourne, Australia. Yeah, okay. hi. Hi, Ashley. It's Katie from London. Um, I've always lived in London, so it was a bit of an accident that I ended up in Australia, in Melbourne, um, for fair bit of time um, but I had the absolute honestly it was an incredible experience I managed to land in one of the only prisons in the world that has um, a theatre program that runs 11 months of the year and that's sort of twice a week and does public performances to policy makers so um, to be quite honest I couldn't believe my luck when I got there I was like of all the places I could have ended up and I'm here so but anyway, it's really, I'm, I'm really overwhelmed to be here today. It's, um, who would have guessed, you know, all those years ago when I was sitting in prison that I'd be talking to you here now. I'm honored. I was grateful for the chance to talk to you when you were in prison, but it's so much <laughs> nicer to talk to you out here. Now, you are one of the few people I met in my travels throughout the world who had an extensive theater background prior to joining a prison theater troupe. Could you talk to us a little bit about your life in the theater and how that cycled before, during, and after incarceration? Yes, absolutely. So I originally trained to be an actress. Um, I worked as a professional actress um, in my 20s. I went on to set up my own theatre company and we did some, I, it's a production company, we did like the odd film, I wouldn't get too excited, <laughs> but we created it. Um, and then, you know, life got in the way and everything went a bit wrong. And, you know, I, I yeah, obviously I ended up in prison. I'd stopped acting long before that. And so, yeah, I don't know. I got into prison and this amazing theatre company and it was just, it was like a gift. Um, my creativity came back. I started writing plays and writing songs and all sorts of things and poems. And I think the biggest thing was the, the thing that really struck me when I first walked into that group, um, the ladies that ran it, um, they called me an artist. They didn't call me a prisoner or, you know, I was an artist. I don't know why that was so groundbreaking at the time because, you know, you're in prison and you really are reminded you are the bottom <laughs> of society. You're, you've, you've entered a whole new class <laughs> of, you know, it's, it's, it's quite unsettling. So yeah, to sort of walk in and yeah, I don't know, just artist. And I, I remembered who I was. It took me the, probably the whole of my prison sentence to really sort of rebuild myself. But that was the thing that ignited the spark. And it, I think it helped me get back on track. I was so moved in seeing the recording of the, I wasn't there when you all were actually performing your play at somebody's daughter but I got to see a video of it afterwards and I got to be in a rehearsal with you all one day while you were working on this extraordinary play. And one of the things that was so moving about it to me was that you were getting ready to go home at the time that the play was being produced and your character, your fictional character in the play was also somebody who was leaving the life she had known to go to a better life in London. And I'm wondering if you could talk about what it meant to you to be able to put your own story into this very professional, beautiful production that somebody's daughter theater company was doing. Um, well, so that when you visited, that was the third third year or the third play. Um, and so each had, each play had told a part of my story, but again, in a, in a in a character. So what you saw was yes, me preparing to go home and the character that I had I was playing. Uh, the, the idea was she was homeless and she had ended up in Australia after um, giving her life savings to a, a man she'd met online, and of course he did a runner, and she was stuck 
there and she had no money and she was trying to sell umbrellas to get back. <laughs> so that <laughs> that mirrored my story. It was all about going home. And I guess I've been selling my umbrellas by putting myself back together whilst I was in prison. So that was my way. And the play, uh, you know, she finally sells her last umbrella and she's going home. And it was a genuine um, retelling of, you know, my story and my excitement, but also um, my sadness of leaving all these people that I'd met. I remember arriving there and thinking, this is my life now. Look, you know, you just got to build a life. You're stuck here for however many years. You, you know, this is your community. And, and that's what I did. And so that was a shock when I came to leave because I didn't realize how heartbreaking it would be to leave everyone and never, in most cases, ever be able to see them again because they live in another country, which I'm never allowed into again <laughs> for the rest of my life. So <laughs> they probably can't come to London either. So it was quite extraordinary that that caught up with me, to be honest. But all the shows we did, it was so special. Like I said, it's one of the few theatre programmes that is able to do these public performances in a maximum security prison. Um, they bring in policy makers. Um, and so you, we get to tell our stories. We get to say what we want to be heard directly to the people that have the power to change things. That's incredible. It, the work that somebody's daughter of theatre company is doing is really of remarkably high quality and originality. And it was such a blessing to get to meet you and, and spend that day together in Australia. I hope we'll have many days together in the free world. Thank you so much, Katie. I wanna turn now to Autumn Hales, who comes to us from the Prison Performing Arts Company, which is based in St. Louis, Missouri, here in the United States. And Autumn was the star of a glorious production called Hip Hop Hamlet. And I would love to hear from you, Autumn, about who you are and what your relationship to the theater has been. Hello, I am, um, I'm Autumn Hales. Um, I joined PPA, I believe in 2015. Um, Prison Performing Arts was a very amazing program. A lot of people actually, when I was in, weren't interested in it. They, um, it's amazing how many people do, do not like Shakespeare. <laughs> they do not like the plays. I don't know if it's because they're difficult to understand and, and uh, the speech is difficult and uh, a lot of people just didn't want to commit to something. Um, here I was, I had just given birth to a set of twins in prison and had to give them away and some, uh, not give them away, I'm sorry, I do have them. They went, they went home with their father, but it was a very difficult time for me. And I had um, a friend of mine, they just walked up to me, they had scripts in their hands and they said, we need you to take this part. And I said, okay. Until, of course, I started flipping through the script and I said, oh my God, are all these highlighted parts mine? And they said, yes. And I was like, um, you said we perform in like three weeks. They're like, yes. This was uh, the Rover part two. It was just after um, a wonderful lady named Agnes uh, had just transferred over the PPA program um, to Miss Rachel Tibbetts, uh, who I worked with. Uh, but it was an amazing experience. It was kind of just what I needed in the moment. Um, giving up a part of you, even though they're still there, they're not, it was very hard, but I was able to kind of fill that gap with um, a whole different family. So it was pretty amazing. That's beautiful. And Agnes Wilcox, who you referenced, was one yes. of the, yes. the glorious leaders in prison theater in the world. Uh, may she rest in peace. We've We've lost her in recent years, but she was a, a formidable and really beautiful presence in our world of prison theater making. So I just want to lift up her memory and honor her as we have this conversation. Could you tell me a little bit about the process of working on Hip Hop Hamlet and what it was like to, to oh. change Shakespeare into a very different feeling kind of play? Uh, absolutely. So Hip Hop Hamlet ended up being um, probably my favorite play that I've ever done. 
may, for a couple of reasons. Um, in plays that I have done in the past, um, I have always been casted as a mom, as a sister, you know, a, a, as a woman. So it was um, very different uh, for me to be casted as a male part. My only other male part before this was Antigone, and I played Creon. So coming into this, I was like, okay, I had a little taste of how to play a man, and I took that with me. But then we added the difficulty of rapping. I am not a rapper. <laughs> I'm not a rapper at all. It was actually quite horrible at first. Um, I thought about giving up many, many times because I was like, I can't do this. I sound awful. I have to act like a man, look like a man, and rap. <laughs> that was not working. So... Um, but it was such a, a wonderful process because everyone was so uplifting and, and they believed, even if in the back of their minds, they were like, oh, we may be in trouble. Um, everybody was very uplifting. And that particular uh, play was not only difficult, but it was also, uh, it, it was so much fun. Being able to put music in and rap and then also performing that for um, so many people around you that we, we don't get to really listen outwardly to that type of you know, music and, and, and things to that nature when you're in prison. So to be able to have this little beat and then all of us rapping all of these words, people, it was the biggest performance I think we had. We had so many people come to every single one of these performances and they were able to escape for a moment. And you felt that in that performance. So working on it was very hard. I swear I listened to that DVD uh, or that CD over and over and over, just trying to get my words right. Uh, but it was probably the biggest accomplishment that I had doing theater. So uh, I loved it. Chris Limber is amazing. He uh, was so patient and so helpful and was willing to work on the side with us. And he really made it possible for us to be able to, to grow to what we became in that play. That's beautiful. You still haven't told us who you played in Hip Hop oh, yes, Hamlet. I'm so sorry. Yes, I, I played Hamlet. Um, I was cast as Hamlet. I was not expecting to be Hamlet <laughs> whatsoever. So when I got cast as, Ham as Hamlet, I'm like, mm. but of course, I remember when I first met Chris Limber, he told us he uh, one of his many gifts were, were to uh, cast plays. He was very good at judging who needed to be where. So part of me was like, maybe his, you know, little guessing gadget is broken because I don't know why I'm Hamlet, but it turned out to work out perfect. So it was wonderful. It was great. You gave a stunning performance as Hamlet. Thank it was you. really incredible. And for anybody watching who wants to see Autumn in that role, the, the production of Hip Hop Hamlet in which she was the star is available online at the Prison Performing Arts website. So you can watch it there as I did. Uh, and there was a version in a men's prison too that was very different than the version in the women's prison. And both are available in, in full length um, on video through that website. Absolutely beautiful and fantastic work. Thank you so much, Autumn. Thank the you. last person I wanna introduce you all to uh, in this beautiful panel is very, very dear to my heart. One of my former students, a proud graduate of the University of Michigan, Justin Gordon. Hi, Justin. Oh, you need to unmute so we can hear your beautiful voice. Hello, hello, greetings, greetings, happy Friday. <laughs> Thank you for coming here to join us, Justin. Your story is one that I write about in the introduction of the book and one that was particularly painful for me. Uh, because it involved you getting arrested and spending some time in jail while you were a student at the University of Michigan and actually while you were helping me do research for the book. So uh, the summer that that happened, unfortunately, Justin was actually doing incredible and really beautiful research on Somebody's Daughter Theater Company, uh, which features Katie Langford, who was here today. So while I was getting to meet Katie, uh, some not so fortunate things were unfolding on the University of Michigan campus. And I'm just wondering if you could talk to us, Justin, about, um, first of all, why you wanted to work on this book project with me, how you got excited about the idea of being a researcher for a book on theater in prisons and what the theater meant to you while you were going through a tough time in your life. Yes, uh, well, when I was 17, going on 18 years old, I was facing 15 years in prison. And that was really my first time interacting with 
the prison industrial complex and I felt betrayed uh, by a number of people and a number of entities. But my first safety, my first run to safety, I actually wrote my first play um, ever, like days after I caught that charge. And that, this, is, this is instinctively, I had to, I, it, was, it was the way that I processed, you know, the grief or the confusion that I was feeling. I actually wrote a play uh, that was based on Judas Iscariot, which is, which, which, who, who had betrayed Jesus Christ in the Bible. And my family, after I wrote that play, I, you know, I, I wanted to do theater, you know, amidst going through my drama. And my family was like, you're never going to make money like that. And they very discouraged it. And so I went through community college and I was still fighting cases going through community college, not really having a sense of identity, just knowing the good, good grades. And when I finally got the opportunity to meet Dr. Ashley Lucas and come to the university's campus, summer 2014, I saw an opportunity to do something that that meant something to me also, but I knew that meant something bigger to the whole world. And, and it, it was deeper than just a class selection because I had a, a place where I could funnel my frustrations and my confusion and my, and my willingness to try to help others and do it in an educational way. So, so I was still getting educated, but I was getting educated on things that matter. And and as that was unfolding, and of course, you know, the, the summer, the summer after that, you know, when I got into trouble, it theater kept me. You know, even when I was in jail, you know, I did, I did, I finished my theater homework when I was in jail. I used to have to, I used, to, I was in a bunk. It was loud, people screaming, you know, just just making noise. I was, a, I did a lot of my homework when I was a trustee, but it was still like loud. They, they try to, you know, not follow the rules, you know, and so I had to like kind of block all that out. And, and use the toilet paper or use the, the, the brown, the brown paper towel to do my homework and send it in the mail because I wasn't trying to waste money, waste com commissary money on paper. And they didn't just want to give me paper. They didn't even believe me when I said I went to university. I remember the security guards to laugh at me when I told them I went to University of Michigan. <laughs> um, and it, it kept me, it kept me focused, you know, it, it was a way to marry my love and my passion with something I can serve the world with. And, and, and to this day, you know, the theater does that for me. That's beautiful, Justin. And I'm so grateful that you stayed so dedicated to the theater and came back to us and graduated with honors from the University of Michigan. I'm so proud of you. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what you did after graduation and where the theater has taken you? Uh, well, after after graduation, it's funny. I actually went to the National Theater Institute, which is in Waterford, Connecticut. And when I was in the National Theater Institute, I actually went to London. I'm so I, I I'm so sad that I missed Katie. I wish I would have saw Katie when I was in London. But you know, next time, uh, I I studied with Complicite Theater, which is a physical theater company, and I really you know uh, uh, made I'm making my attempt to hone my craft on stage and screen acting. But you know that it, it travels. It travels with you. You know, having incarceration experience travels with you wherever you go. And I, I, there are some opportunities that I was denied. Like that was my first time even ha being able to travel outside of Michigan, uh, and that was my first time even living outside of Michigan. What was was attending the National Theater Institute, and because of my experiences, I couldn't really enjoy it as much as I wanted to because. Because of my life experiences, I noticed the microaggressions and the institutional racism that 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 that, that place had no choice but to harbor, you know. And, and because I because I have the history and 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 I, and I know about how you know how we got our wealth in this country, and so while I stay dedicated to the theater and I look forward to you know rising through the ranks, I I, I have to acknowledge, you know, where where I'm seeing. Oh, that's why many people that also without felonies that that's black that's poor. That's why I'm the only person here. It's a reason why. In the theater, so so you know we had to we had to get that together in the theater industry as well because it was a reason why I felt so uncomfortable, so ostracized, and felt like I was alone. And in your many different kinds of work with the Prison Creative Arts Project, how did that theater community feel to you? What did it give you when you were doing things with PCAP? Complete opposite. Complete opposite. I felt I felt at home. I I I feel I felt. That that I remember, 
I, we was in Chippewa Valley Correctional Facility, and we was doing theater games. <laughs> we made up this this world, you know, where it's like 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 the 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 devised theater uh, uh, play feature. Uh, one of the gentlemen, and he was a baseball star, and like and like, and, and 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 myself and my co-facilitator, we were like the commentators to this like baseball league. And, and we made this whole world, you know, sitting in this facility. And, and the fellas afterwards, you know, said it without being prompt. Like, man, I feel like, I feel like we wasn't in prison for these past two hours, you know? And like, we was laughing. And, and that's the type of theater that I want, that, that I want to make. That's, I never forget that. I never, for, I never forget the game and the advice and the wisdom that I got from those gentlemen that I had the, the, the blessing to work with. And that's just one, that's just one instance. But I, I definitely remember that and, and the way it made me feel, made me feel like I'm doing something worthwhile with my entertainment. You know, like it's, it's not just entertainment. It's not, it's art, like I said, that can change things. I'm not interested in just like getting in front of a rich white person and try to convince them with my theater. I, I'm i gonna go where the ground is. I'm gonna go where the streets are. I'm gonna go where the people are. And, and, that, and, that's, and that satisfies my soul. Thank you. I'm so grateful that you were a part of of our family at PCAP and for all of the work that you've done with us in many different arenas. I wanna turn back to Mary and ask a, a little bit about what's going on in your life now and how the theater uh, continues to have a presence and a force in the work that you do today. Unmute yourself, Mary. So now and for the last several months, actually, um, I've been working with the team at the Prison Creative Arts Project to create correspondence workshops uh, in lieu of the workshops that we had done in person for over 30 years. Uh, that's quite a leap. It's quite a leap when you have this wonderful, rich body of work that everybody in your group and your troops have um, participated in inside and somehow translate that into a correspondence work shop that will go back and forth week by week from participant and facilitator inside for the participant inside. And then um, for the full exchange of 10 or 12 or 14 workshops for a semester um, in school time in university time and, and still get the creation of the experience. So it's been, I think, phenomenal that we still can practice theater skills and share work and share uh, our lives and um, and collect things that can be curated and put into places like the Bentley Historical Library, where 200 years from now, people that are doing research on the arts in the age of mass incarceration will see the Prison Creative Arts Project, will see Shakespeare in prison, will see the evidence of us trying to live our best lives and, and, and lift up each other up um, in the middle of a most horrific pandemic. So, um, and out of that has come, we have been able, because we don't have to worry about getting a lien cleared to get anybody in. So we could have associates that have worked for us for years and facilitators and benefactors and students and, you know, family folk um, can participate as a facilitator one-on-one -on -one in a correspondence uh, workshop with the prisoner. Uh, that's phenomenal. And in the same way, when Corona hit, we had to take our 25 year old annual exhibition of art by Michigan prisoners and put pieces of it online in lieu of in person in the gallery. Um, you know, that was just, oh, I was crushed because we couldn't hang the show. We couldn't have our events that we normally would have had for 25 years around the show where thousands and thousands of people came to see the work and hear the stories and, you know, have us participate in as well who are free. But out of that effort by putting it online, now we're hearing from people in the UK and Australia and Brazil and all, all across the country who are delighted that um, they can actually see the work. So it's, it's like stepping into the future to me, um, but it's also um, really challenging for folks that are so physical, you know, the theater is so physical um, to try and translate that into a work that we can share together. And that's, I think that's a challenge of our time moving forward into the digital age. Um, so that when we do um, have the day when we can all go back inside and it will happen, um, we nonetheless will still have created a body of work that can, that can continue to grow. 
It's true. It's it, there are many unexpected blessings in the ways that we've had to pivot in this strange moment of the pandemic. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Gee, I, I want to turn back to you now and ask you how you're doing these days and what role, if any, the theater plays in your life today. I think you're muted, G. If you can unmute your phone, we'd love to hear from you. G, do you see a button to unmute on your phone? Well, maybe we'll circle back to you, G. Keep working on it. See if you can find a way to unmute on your phone. I will, um, I will instead turn to Katie and ask about how the theater is playing a role in your life today, if it is. Well, yes, it does. I, I have a normal day job. So I've been back home for five years and I I'm, I'm just actually took breath and sort of looked back about what I've achieved in those years. I sort of rebuilt my life from scratch. I've actually ended up working in a day job, which has nothing to do with theatre, but, <laughs> but I create opportunities for people who've experienced homelessness and um, the criminal justice system to get employed. So that's, that pays for everything. And then um, I'm also a trustee of a charity called the Museum of Homelessness, which is a social justice museum, but we do lots of theatre. It's like a no museum you've ever seen. It doesn't have a home and we collect people's stories. And so we, and we have actors who have all been homeless themselves from Cardboard Citizens. That's an amazing theatre company here in England. And they perform these stories. So people donate their stories and they're about criminal justice, homelessness. Um, so at the moment, because of coronavirus, we've actually taken this museum onto the streets. So it's a street museum and we, like we did it in front of the home office as well because of their treatment recently of um, people who are seeking asylum in England. So we did that to highlight. So it's really, really exciting. Um, we put on a massive show in Manchester in an old um, depot. We had a real ambulance, you know, we did this one massive, there was hundreds of people involved in that show um, performing. Um, and then I'm also a trustee as well of another charity called Arts and Homelessness International. And that's an international charity and they do work all over the place, Japan, street choirs in Brazil. And yeah, I'm, I'm honored. I mean, I just, every day I wake up and I go, oh my God, this is my life. I'm so lucky. And yeah, it makes you very aware when you've lost everything or you've been in prison. Just, I don't know, the joy it gives you afterwards, the small things, it's, that's a gift. It is, I think it, it's a gift that is hard for people to understand if they haven't been through something like that themselves, but knowing what really matters to you in the world and being able to act strongly upon that and to serve other people is an incredible blessing. And I so admire your work, Katie. I've been so lucky. I've managed to see Karen and Maud who run somebody's daughter theater company. They've been over to England twice, which, oh, we, yeah, that was just, they're, they're amazing. They've got this energy. I cry every time I see them because these women, they just are, oh, they're powerhouses of positiveness <laughs> in a very bleak place. And yeah, so I, you're lucky I haven't cried. Normally I get quite emotional when I talk about anything like this. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's yeah, been a wonderful, wonderful few years. Thank you so much, Katie. I think that we've got G back on the phone. Can you hear me, G? G, can you talk to us? Maybe we don't have G back on the phone. Hello? Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm so happy to hear your sweet voice, I'm so happy to hear your this phone. <laughs> this thing is out of the <laughs> Well, welcome back. I wanted to yes, ask you uh, what, if any, uh, role the theater plays in your life right now. So whether you're making any theater or not, do you feel the presence of all of the work that you did inside with Shakespeare Behind Bars, having an active life in the work that you do now out in the world? 
Oh, most definitely. Uh, it's definitely a, a application in every aspect of my life. Um, I could be at the work site or I could be dealing with people. I share experience I just had with some guys. I know some guys out here and what they do is they make movies and they marginalize themselves and um, they make what they call hood movies these days, which is very uh, oxymoron to me. But anyway, I was telling them, well, I think so, not so, go outside the box. And we were just talking like maybe two days ago, and I told him it was a quote from Shakespeare that I ran across from King Richard when he said, uh, they would rather bear those ills they have than fly to others that they know not of. And I'm like, why well, would you propagate something that you've been through that wasn't productive in your life so much as well, you can go elsewhere and try something different. And you may like it, you know. Uh, it's those situations where the arts come into my life at. And whereas I could be a beacon of hope with that and tell somebody something like that, like, don't put yourself in such a small box. I mean, these are immortal words that come from beautiful people that expressed this stuff centuries ago, and it's more relevant today than it probably was yesterday. But in my life, per se, personal, um, it gave me a spine, <laughs> a spine that's to say it's all right to be all right. Uh, it's all right to be a fallible creature. It's all right to be a, a human being with a, a with a cap on you. You know, uh, you live your life. You live it on theater. You do it like uh, like they did in theater. I mean, you met so many. I met so many characters, right? But it was so real what they was expressing. Uh, as you like it, uh, it's stuff in there like. A guy told me, one of my mentors said, this is one of the speeches that he gave to his son when he got married. Um, think Hamlet. I played Hamlet. I tell people that these days, they were like, you did what? Hamlet? you know how big that is? And it's like, I played Hamlet. You know, uh, when she was saying that about Hamlet and hip hop and she played Hamlet, I'm like, oh my God, I gave up three fingers to see that done by a female and hip hop. You uh, can so see it. It's things. online. You've got to watch it. It's yes, fantastic. I'm going to watch it. I, I'm going to watch it, but it makes me a better person. It uh, took me to a place where it was empathy, where I can recognize people as people. Um, it took me to a spot to let me know that all the world is a stage, right? And you got your exit and you got your interests. Uh, it showed me a whole lot. Where, like I always say, and this is one of my epiphanies of life, I heard her saying about in prison where nobody really knows what you go through in prison unless somebody had been through it. And I say that all the time. It's existing or impossible for somebody to understand what you've been through if they haven't been there with you. But by the same token, I can say, too, something that I learned about that thing is that people are going to be people. It just matters, like Kurt said, what type of person you're going to be, wherever you're going to be. And that's what the art showed me. If I'm somewhere, let me be an asset. Let me be a positive aspect. So much is what I was seeing when reading the arts. When reading uh, Shakespeare, whether it was that or the stories that we hear, it's, it definitely gave me a deeper brand of empathy where I can understand, like, I left young and I came back middle age, right? So a lot of the daily responsibilities of an adult, I didn't get. I'm getting them now. And it demands a lot of um, patience, particularly being a returning citizen. And when you go to the social services, when you go to the uh, secretary of state, so when you go to get a job, it demands a high level of patience. What I can do is empathize with the one woman over there that's just over there checking for the paper trail before they send you down to the other part of it. So the arts gave me that to be able to empathize with all of those type of situations on an everyday basis, uh, that you're accountable, you're responsible, a high level of maturity, see where you're at with it. What does it mean to you? How are you going to live your life in this moment? Life only consists of a bunch of moments. And this moment here may be a defining moment for you. Treat a person like a person, want to be a person. So it's those things that the arts gave me under the tutelage of uh, Kurt L. Toughlin and Sidney Shakespeare behind bars that I know, like I said, beyond a reasonable doubt, propels me to be a better person. And uh, I'm sunk on that anchor right there, Ashley. I am. Um, I really am. Uh, stop it. Stop it. Hello? I'm here, G. I think that is okay. such a beautiful okay. way to talk about how the theater's had an impact on your life, but it made you a better person. And yes. And I got a three, I got a three-month-old pit, pit bull that I'm stuck with. This is my little guy. Quit barking at me. mad because I don't want to let him tear up my new socks. Here, take it and go. <laughs> that's, that's the arts right there. Take it and go. <laughs> He's three months old. He is terrible. <laughs> Well, I think he's going to make a new art project with your socks, and I hope yes, you can use it in some theater. I'm, yes, ma'am. 
<laughs> Thank you, G. I'm going to turn Intern. back to the other Hamlet, to Autumn. Yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> Autumn, how is the theater playing a role in your life today? Um, honestly, not as much as I want it to. Uh, with uh, the whole coronavirus and everything, it's oh. definitely affected a lot for us. Um, but on a positive note, I am still able to be a part of PPA through, um, we do uh, weekly Zoom meetings. So we are actually reading a script, uh, a new script for a new play. So being able to still do that, I didn't think it was gonna be the same thing as when we're in person, but it is, it's really quite amazing that we can still get together and feel that emotion between each other and not actually be in person. So I found that to be quite fun and quite interesting. Um, but PPA, uh, Prison Performing Arts and, and theater in general, it, it stuck with me um, uh, through my entire journey, not just in prison, but also outside. I think it prepared oh. me a lot, um, not only uh, for being able to take care of my family, which is very difficult. I went from before when I was incarcerated, before I got incarcerated, I had one child. Uh, I came out to three and a husband. So um, juggling life, you would think, uh, w whenever you go to prison, you are only responsible for yourself. Um, and you can choose to have really no responsibilities at all, but PPA made me not only responsible for my actions and what I brought to the table, but also if I didn't, if I was not on top of my job, if I was not on top of what I was doing in the play, I let everybody down. So it, it kind of correlates to me in everyday life because uh, my family depends upon me. And I was able to build myself up so much through performing. Um, I didn't have um, a lot of respect for myself after I became incarcerated. I um, definitely um, succumbed to my emotional pity, not just for myself, but for what I had done and what society might think about me, what my kids might think about me one day. And I was able to rebuild myself piece by piece, play by play, word by word. And without prison performing arts, I know I wouldn't be as strong as I am now, as as um, capable as I am now. I do hair now, I'm a hairstylist, and I have to be able to act on the fly, <laughs> kind of like in theater. Sometimes things just go wrong, so you just gotta kind of go with it, and I am able to do that. I am, uh, I'm able to work with all different types of people, and this has definitely helped me to be able to do that as well. As silly as it might sound that theater and hair could come together, it really does. It's it's helped me be who I am today. I think that's so true. I, I know in my own life, I feel like my theatrical experience and my ability to think on my feet follows me in everything that I'm doing, even if it's not actually theater. Thank you so much, Autumn. Justin. Thank you. I know that you're doing big things in the world and that you are every day and in every way very theatrical. So how are you putting the theater to use in your life these days? And what do you carry with you from your experiences with PCAP as you do that work? Yes. <clears throat> I'll say uh, two things. I, I just want to join the Hamlet train real quick. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I actually play Hamlet myself, but it was only a scene. I play, I play, I play Ham, I played a scene of Hamlet when I was at the National Theater Institute mm -hmm. just a few months back. And you write, uh, Autumn, that them, them lines, them lines <laughs> is no joke, you know. So it, I, you know, it, 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 it's like in life, it helped it helped me with my memorization skills. It definitely helped help me help make me a memorizer for sure. You know, and and, and currently I, I'm still pursuing uh to be the best stage and screen actor I can be. Uh, uh, it's to be elite as far as working 80 hours a week, you know, just making it happen. So I, I'm still very, very callable. You know, my line is open. But uh, uh, also right now I'm working with the youth, first through eighth grade. Uh, I'm working with them in person while they come to the community center that I work at. They bring their Chromebooks and they do their virtual learning, this unprecedented moment in educational history in our country and in our world. And any teachers out there know that any element of teaching comes with an element of theater because just like autumn said things go wrong you know uh so i definitely employ my theater skills to best serve the youngsters right now and and that's my crown and achievement right now that's why I'm, I'm i'm very i'm very blessed to, to do that every day that's gorgeous justin and i'm so proud of you and all the work that you do with those kids i know that 
they look up to you and admire you as I do. I want to bring our whole group back together if we can uh, as we're starting to wrap up the panel to ask you all to help me think through this question of what we want the world to be talking about in connection to these issues. So this panel is part of the Shakespeare in Prisons Network conference and they're going to be people watching this from all over the world and we have a chance to try to start a conversation with them. What kinds of conversations do we want people to be having about prison arts programs, about what they do in the world, the effects that they have on people inside the walls and people who come outside of the walls and live again in the free world? Um, what are the things that are most important to you as people who have been through this programming in prisons that you want the rest of the world to talk about? And I'll sort of open that up for any of y'all who want to respond, just unmute yourself and chime in. This is Mary. I would like for folks that are hearing these words to think about who the actors are inside. And many of those folks are lifers and folks that have served year after year after year after year that deserve a chance in the world. And I'd like for us to rethink the concept of parole boards. Why should a parole board be a group that is appointed at a fat salary with a fat uh, expense account um, and subject to politics? Why can't it be like a mutual aid society of actors in the world, like a group, a troop, uh, us in Detroit or New York or LA? Why can't community members uh, gather and support the release of that individual that's coming home that we know that we've trusted, that we've worked with for years and that will sponsor? It takes a village to raise a returnee. Why can't the arts communities locally, like mutual aid societies, help folks that are coming out of prison so they don't end up with holes in their pockets sitting on a park bench trying to figure out which way is east or, east or west. I mean, the, the folks that are inside that should be released in the age of COVID that are really suffering need a break. And I would hope that we could imagine, reimagine arts community support out here for those inside so that they can come home to us. Beautiful, Mary, thank you. And I wanna lift up the work that Prison Creative Arts Project students have been doing during the pandemic and having a, a mutual aid fund that people can donate to. And we'll make that link available to everybody in case you're interested. Katie, I saw you starting to say something earlier. I'm not getting your sound, Katie. I'm not sure if anybody else is. I'm really sorry. There you Can you go. hear me now? I yes, got too excited. Yeah, I got too excited <laughs> and pulled out the thing. Right. <laughs> so basically, um, in London, I don't know if you know, but all, you know, I'm sure it's the same for you. All the theatres are shut, and art. It feels like there's an attack on art and just theatre in general. And so, um, you know, can I don't want to live in a world where there's no theatre um it's such a special magic thing and what it did for people who i you know served time with and the changes in them um ashley you met Gemma, um someone who's no longer with us but if if you had seen the difference that's what i want the world to see the difference the way it can light someone up the confidence they find um it's it's a really special thing and yeah we just stop taking money away from the arts you know this is vital to living thank you katie justin i saw you about to say something earlier too i i'm not gonna try to spend time you know convincing people who don't want to be convinced so my message is just for the young people who are currently involved you know who are in who are incarcerated or or, or, or just coming home or or, or going through they, they go through a very wise woman on this zoom chat told me justin be be kinder than what is absolutely necessary and and i and that proved to be a radical behavior change for me and and i and i know it, it just 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 as g had mentioned you know some of them guys stand up guys guys that really had to go through and do things for real it changes them too you you can plant the seed of kindness through theater 
or through just having a conversation like that, you might not see it right there in your face instant, but 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 that seed of kindness will sprout. You mm -hmm. might not live to see it, but you gotta have that faith that it will grow and it is gonna grow. And so I'm I'm here to tell talk to the young people. Be kind when it's necessary and and watch that magic. I love watching it in you, Justin. Autumn, did you want to chime in? I, I, I do. I kind of want to touch a little bit on what everybody has said here because um, yes, uh, it's so important to talk to the children, to the, talk to the young ones. There are so many young children also getting incarcerated right now and they're just lost. They don't have any anyone, especially when you get incarcerated, you're young. It is so easy to fall into such a bad place. Um, but personally watching with a uh, prison performing arts and watching how that helped so many people grow as individuals. Uh, generally, whenever you arrive in prison, you've got so many people that are just down on you, hard on you, if you're not part of this group, that group. Um, and finding something like theater and a family, that's for some people, that is the only family that they will have. They don't have family on the outside. They're looking at 50, 60 years in prison and their children. Um, so prison performing arts is more than just the arts. That's a wonderful thing. That's like the that's like the icing. That's like the extra fun we get to have. But it is also something that can make somebody feel whole that may never have that opportunity. So I think it, it goes beyond um, what we see, and I think what we can really understand, especially for those that have never been incarcerated. But I have watched. Um, a young woman, I don't know if you all have ever heard of a woman named Patty Pruitt, if you have not, um, please look her up. Um, she is the most, probably the most amazing woman I've ever met in all my life. She has been a part of PPA for years, but she has done more than that. She has helped women get out of prison. Um, she has been in prison for 30 plus years now, um, but she is a major part. That is like her her little home. That is her her life, her children. She she raises these little, these little baby chicks and sends them out into the world, a lot of them through PPA. So I just think theater is, is so much more uh, than what some people really realize. And I, I really hope they, they take the chance and the opportunity to look into this further and see just how amazing it is and how it affects all of us for years to come. Thank you, Autumn. Such yeah. wisdom. I appreciate all of that. Dee, I don't know if you can unmute real fast. We're at the end of our time. Not sure if you can unmute again, G. But if we can't get G back, I want to close by saying thank you to each of you. I am so moved by all of the stories that you have told here, by the beauty of the work that I saw you doing while you were inside the walls and since you've come home. I wanna thank you for being brave and willing to share your stories in a public forum and for continuing to support the theater and to support the theater work that's happening with people who are still inside the walls. Thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you on another time.